on this episode of Skeptico. A show about arguing. And then you guys quiz each other. Mr. Winger, is that really the best use of our time? It seems like the value of having you here I is think my be- value as a teacher is to teach you how to learn. I think you're telling us we should teach ourselves. I don't think you're going to learn if I tell you how to think. I think if you tell us what you think, then we'll learn that. I thought you should break into groups, but you failed to learn that, so your theory is invalid. <laughs> Even arguing with people you like. Use the term cranky. You said he was cranky. In my experience. You have yeah, you can put it in cranky. Yeah, well, probably. I'd say high probability of crazy. Really? Well, you need to read it, and you need to... I, I do, I do, I do, I do need well, to I read it. Call, I wouldn't call somebody cranky if I'd not read their work. That first clip was from Jill McHale and Community. And the second one was from today's guest, Anthony Peake, who I genuinely like and respect, even though I think he stretches the metaphor a little bit too far. He always brings a lot of good research to the table, and I certainly like that. Stick around for the interview. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Karras, and today we welcome Anthony Peake back to Skeptico. Tony has a new book. A new book is an old, an old book that is a new book, but it's, it's just interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to diving into this with him. The book is Cheating the Ferryman. The Revolutionary Science of Life After Death, the sequel to the best-selling Is There Life After Death? So uh, that's the new book. I, I got to figure out how you got so much in that title on Amazon. They let you do that. That's great, man. Good for you. Tony, welcome back. Thanks for being here. Yeah, always enjoy Alex our discussions. I always find them the most stimulating I do, basically, because you do your research and you really do know your stuff. And what I always admire about you is that you don't toe the line. And if somebody says something you don't agree with, you'll tell them. And I think that's profoundly important, you know. But funnily enough, in terms of the the actual title in there, it's extraordinary, isn't it? This is I don't do this. This is my publishers. I, I didn't even know <laughs> they'd done this. So clearly it's quite a mouthful, isn't it, really? It's good. It's good. It 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 kind of brings it brings us around because that's what the book does is it brings us around to the idea that here's a guy who's had this theory. He's been working on this theory for a relatively long time, Mm. has synthesized a lot of different sources, has, let me pull up on the screen for anyone who's watching, written a bunch of other books. And those are just some of them on the website, anthonypeak.com. You can also find them on Amazon. You know, the last time you were on Skeptico, it was 447. Really enjoyed the chat. And it was kind of centered around this book, The Hidden Universe, an investigation into non-human intelligences. Really a, another great book. You know, I, I mentioned this the last time we spoke, and I want to mention it again, because what you do is really quite unique and what you've been able to kind of muster and just kind of plow your way through is this non-ordained kind of researcher of consciousness which i think is part of this thing like they have people like i gotta say this because i you know this is going to be a true socratic skeptico kind of thing i don't agree with uh, all your all your theories but I really admire, and I think if it was a, a more just world, uh, academically, intellectually, we would think about you in a much different way. You, you would have multiple PhDs. You'd be kind of much more sought after in terms of the way you're synthesizing this information. But that's never going to happen because from Jump Street, you are counter, very counter fundamentally to the whole consciousness, biological robot, meaningless universe. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you're a Liverpool guy and you're just kind of a street guy. You're not afraid to say, hey, that's just obviously bullshit. So we can kind of dismiss with that. And now let's explore this. Let's explore that. And, you know, the fact that you've been able to gain any traction at all (laughs) is, is amazing, let alone write these really fantastically interesting books that are packed with solid research, solid, you know, peer reviewed stuff that's coming onto the scene and you are then synthesizing into your theory. So that's what you do. And I'm so glad you're out there doing it. 
Thanks, Alex. I mean, one of the things that, that I find is that, and I've used this argument many, many times. I mean, I have been offered uh, places to do, a, do PhDs on the back of my research. And indeed, over the years, I've been offered the opportunity to do PhDs in various different subjects. I mean, initially when I started off, I was planning to do a PhD in Italian Renaissance art and particularly the paintings of a guy called Piero della Francesca, which de developed my interest in um, esotericism because I was interested in the esoteric aspects of a lot of the Renaissance painters and the symbolism within the paintings. And of course, at that period, you had people like Pico Medio Merendola, you had various other philosophers and everything else as well in, in Florence and various other cities. Then I had the opportunity to do a PhD in business management after I did my postgraduate course at the London School of Economics. But I'd all, I've always argued that it's not possible to do a PhD in the areas I'm interested in because it's too diverse. It's too wide. In order to, to write the kind of stuff I write about, you'd need to have a PhD in neurology, astrophysics, quantum physics, neurochemistry. So what I do is I try to synthesize all these things and bring them together in, in a way that people can understand and appreciate. Because I think there's too much going on here that we know that quantum physics is telling us that the universe is a far, far stranger place than anything we can possibly understand. And in this case, I, I, I quote somebody like, I don't know, Richard Feynman, one of the world's leading quantum physicists. And he said to his students, and he said, you know, when you first doing, when you first do your courses on quantum physics, don't try to understand it. Don't go down the rabbit hole because there lies insanity. We don't know what is going on, but we know it works. And this is the thing, of course, quantum physics is the most accurate form of science we've ever had in history. You know, it's accurate to, I think somebody said one hair's length in terms of statistics, one hair's length across the Atlantic in terms of distance. That's how accurate it is, but nobody understands fully what it means. Now, I think the only way you can ever appreciate fully what quantum mechanics really means is to start applying the cosmology to it, applying the the, the philosophy behind it. And in the book, this is what I try to do. I have whole sections on Vedanta. I have sections on Kashmiri Shaivism. I have sections on the great philosophers in histo historical times who argued that, that the relationship between consciousness and external reality is, is, is not what it seems. You know, there's a term that people use. It's called naive realism. The idea that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between what my brain tells me is out there and what is physically out there. You know, there's all these things, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, when you, when you, when you first come across the discovery that everything that seems to be physical is 99.9999999999996 empty space. And the only things that are physically solid are point particles, such as electrons and quarks both of which are point particles, which means they have no extension in space. So where does reality disappear to? I came across a quotation recently that I really loved. When, uh, I think it was Rutherford discovered that the, the nucleus of the atom at Manchester University, when he discovered that the vast part of the atom was empty space. The next morning when he woke up, he was terrified to step out of bed in case he fell through the floor. Now this shows exactly how strange reality is. And that's all I write about. You know, I, I don't, do I believe my hypothesis? I don't know. I don't know whether I believe it. All I know is that the science points me in that direction. So, uh, great. That's kind of a good segue into the theory, because since this book is kind of, a, I don't know what you'd call it, a, a reboot recap of this body of work. Tell us about the basics. Tell us about the ferryman. Who is the ferryman? And tell us about the daemon. Who's the daemon? And, you know, the, the, just thumbnail sketch. I think that's important. And I think, and, you know, even before you get there, you kind of sketched out some of your background. Take us back even further, if you will. Just how did you even develop as a person into, you know, in thinking the weird creature I am now? Well, no, I, the, into the amazing creature, into the bold creature who says, I'm going to take a year off of my profession. I'm going to risk not having any money being broke because I ought to write a book. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? And then I write it. And I didn't even know what I was going to write it about. That was the extraordinary thing. I mean, I, I you know, I, I have a very understanding wife and she said, look, you really want to write this book. Okay. You know, write the book, take a year out, just take it out. And the first day when I was sitting in front of the, the screen, you know, there's writers say this, the blank screen or the white page crisis. And you go, right, I've now got to start, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm a terrible pro procrastinator. I find all things to do with the thing I'm supposed to be doing. You know, I'll listen to music. I'll do all kinds of things. But what happened was it was quite curious in that I, I was sitting in front of the screen and I, as I was doing so, I started the, the, the end, end, end of my fingers started to go dead and my lips started to tingle. And I realized I was having a migraine aura. Now I've experienced all my life, what's technically called classic migraine, which is you don't necessarily get a headache, but what you do get is you get the aura state, this kind of weird disembodied weird hallucinatory transitory state that you end up in and you know you're going to have a full-blown migraine soon afterwards and mine starts in that way where i get tingling in my fingers and then my eyesight starts to go i start going blind i get white out it's called a scotoma and it moves across from the center of my vision right across since literally i cannot see and this started but what was uncanny was that at the at the time i also had the most incredible sensation of deja vu that I was, that I had at some time in my past sat in front of that computer screen in my home in Horsham in West Sussex down in here in the UK. And when I came out of the aura state, I realized what I wanted to write about. I wanted to understand exactly what deja vu was. And that was the abiding driving force. Now, just a little bit of a background story. I'm from a very working class background. I'm a regular guy, but I, I was gifted, I suppose, with peculiar memory. I've always had this peculiar, virtually eidetic memory, uh, where virtually sometimes, you know, I can, I can remember something and I don't even have to go through the recall facility. It just comes into my mind or I'll be able to read it. I mean, I've read the Encyclopedia Britannica from end to end. And sometimes I will think of something and a concept and I'll see the page in front of me from the Encyclopedia Britannica and I can read down it. I can look at it, which means I've never been beaten in Trivial Pursuit ever. <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> ever beaten me in Trivial Pursuit. That's Everybody cool. wants you on, on your team. Everybody wants you on their team. <laughs> I, I used to actually earn a living on quizzes when I was a period of unemployed. I used to be in quiz teams and I used to drain the quiz machines in the pubs and things because it's just a peculiar thing I can do. But it meant that over the years, and I've always been interested in unusual phenomena. Ever since I first read John Keel way back in the late 1960s, and I then read a British part work called Man, Myth and Magic when I was about 10 or 11. And this made me decide that I, when, when and if I got to university, and at that stage, it wasn't looking that promising because I'd failed my 11 plus, I was at a secondary modern school. But I managed to get to the local grammar school when I was 15 and I flew at the grammar school because it was, it was, it was my kind of environment. I was very sporty. So they like sporty kids. I was an athlete. So they loved that. But on top of that, I had this way with words and I, I, I could write and everything else as well. And I did phenomenally well. And I did very well at my A-levels and from four years of being a no mark kid at a, a, a really rough school. I was, I was, I got a place at one of Britain's top universities, the university of Warwick, and also to read sociology and history, which again was stretching myself because I was doing two degrees in parallel. And I chose sociology and history because the sociology I was interested in, because it gave me the opportunity to study religion. It gave me the opportunity to study cults and religious cults and belief systems. So I was able to dive into the sociology of what it means when people are Jehovah's Witnesses and when people suffer from cognitive dissonance, when Jesus doesn't come when they expect him to, this kind of thing. So I very much focused in on that. And in terms of my history, I again focused in on the history of esoteric belief systems. And I was particularly interested in the crazy, strange religious movements that came out of the 30 years war in, in the 17th century in Germany. And there were some very peculiar religious groups coming up then, because of course it was the breakout from the rule of Catholicism and everybody was reading the Bible and interpreting it in their own way. And of course it was then in the vernacular and the Vulgate, so people could read the Bible and they came up with their own interpretations. So this fascinated me, but of course there was no real opportunities. And when I got my degree and I wanted to do post-grad, 
the only really opportunity for me to do postgraduate was in business. So I went to the London School of Economics to do a postgraduate course in, in, in industrial relations and, and labor law, which I then did. And, and then I started a career within human resources management and compensation and benefits, specializing in compensation and benefits. But all the time I was continually reading, all the time I was reading books on the subject. And you can see from the books behind me, people turn around to me and say, you haven't read all those books. I actually have, you know, and it meant that when I had the opportunity to write a book, it was already in there, but I didn't know my daemon, and we'll come into the daemon in a minute. My daemon had led me from my very earliest age, my own higher self had led me to read the right things in order for when I sat in that room in 1999 in Horsham, I was ready to go. And what happened was it was like, you know, young, there's the Jungian concept of the library angel. I found this was happening. I was finding the books I needed were just coming into my, my, my worldview. It's as if I'd go into a library and a book would be there. I mean, I'll give you a really weird story about this. My wife was talking about getting really hacked off with me about the way in which I felt I was being guided to write this book. And we were staying with my brother-in-law in Cheltenham. And we went into this bookshop and the bookshop books were piled high. It's a secondhand bookshop. Yeah. And Penny turns around to me and she goes, you know, the way you think you're being guided. And I said, yes. And she said, okay, what kind of book do you need now? Cause this is a chaos of a bookshop. What kind of book do you need? Let's see if it really works. So I said, funnily enough, I need a biography on William Blake. And she's standing there and she goes, oh, for Christ's sake. And it was right in front of her in the bookcase. And she picked it out and she threw it across the room in frustration and stormed out. And that was exactly the book I needed. And there were quotations in there I needed. I know you can add to this in a million different ways. The, the phenomenon that you experienced is kind of retold dozens and dozens of time throughout history, both with uh, reading and literature, but in science, you know, I needed the formula, I needed the whatever, you know, right? Well, it was like, like Kekul, Kekul, you know, needed to, to understand the structure of benzene. And he was sitting in front of a roaring log fire, has a hypnagogic image and sees a, a snake eating its own tail. And he realized that the ring, it was a ring structure and benzene was a ring structure. Max Planck, when Max Planck uh, in 1900, Max Planck stood up in December, 1900 and changed science forever. Uh, at a meeting in, in Berlin, when he pointed out that energy came in small units or packages or quanta from the Latin. And he said that that actual work he did was an act of desperation. It was a piece of inspiration that he just threw the idea out like a crazy idea. And it was right. Not only that, but he come up with this number called the Planck constant which is now found in the universe, everywhere in the universe, the Planck constant is there. And yet it was an arbitrary thing. He just grubbed out the air. So it seems that there's a relationship between us and the universe. In other words, when we think about the idea that everything is, we are, there's distance between things. We know from quantum physics that everything is entangled. There's a quantum physics thing called entanglement, where if you put two quantum, you put two quantum particles like electrons or photons, into the same quantum state, then you send them apart. If you do one thing to one, the other one reacts instantaneously. Now the world's most, the, the world should have stopped in 1981 when a guy called Alain Aspe at the, the Institute of Optics in Paris did an experiment which proved non-locality. He proved something that a guy called uh, John Bell had come across, come across in 1964, a Northern Irish guy that was working at CERN. And this proved something called uh, the einstein podolsky rosen paradox, which was written in the mid-1930s by Einstein and a few associates. And it proved, breaking it down, that there is no distance between things, that we think that there's distance, but there isn't. Everything is a single, single unity. Now. If subatomic particles, when they're put in close proximity to each other, become entangled, extrapolate from that the idea that at the first point of the Big Bang, with the, the, the singularity of the Big Bang, every single subatomic particle that is now in the universe was entangled in a point particle 13.7 billion years ago. 
Right. But, but Tony, we've got to be a little careful because that's where people kind of lose the idea. But it, it, it's kind of a bridge too far in some ways in terms of filling it in. Because what I would really bring it back to, and again, in compliments to you and what you do it in the do in the book, is you kind of show where the theory is meeting reality, like the example you gave with Bell. The other one that that I had a guy on just the other day and Quantum Doug, Doug Mets, Dr. Doug Mensky's super smart about quantum mechanics and AI and stuff like that. And we were chatting about, you know, there's a a, a quantum modem now, right? And the Chinese have actually done this and they've demonstrated it. And that always grabs people's attention is when it's, oh, they've engineered it. So they've taken quantum entanglement and they've said, but if you just take the idea that you're saying, and like, I love when you said, you know, the world should have stopped, you know, there's so many times that, that, that there's so many points in the research that you talk about when you say the world should have stopped. The world should have stopped when Max Planck said consciousness is fundamental. I'm, I'm you know, the, the world should have stopped fine. Yeah, anyways, the point about the entanglement modem that I just want to bring it up so people can make this as a touchstone. If you can entangle things and you can manipulate one thing and then have the other thing change, think of what that means for a modem, because that's what communication is mm -hmm. about. Now, they're just doing it with the keys, the security keys, but it's really the same thing to do with the data. It's just the precursor. But it, we will maybe talk about that in a minute, but the fact that we've taken that and now engineered that brings us to a different level. And I think you're knocking on that door a lot and saying, hey, look at this research. You can't just pretend this stuff is in the abstract anymore. But I, I, I want to, if we can, return to something you said just a minute ago, because it's important. I guess when you said it, I was kind of jiggled my memory a little bit. I'm not quite as photographically memorable. I have the photographic memory that you do. But the Jungian angel of the library kind of thing. And then what you're saying in terms of your experience and the experience of many other famous, famous scientists throughout time. You know, I always think, didn't Francis Crick uh, have something with the, see the swirling snakes? I mean, over and over again, that angel of the library is coming into play. But Tony, tie us down here. You're calling that. You're calling that out. And you're saying, well, okay, that's how you've understood it. And here's the demonstrated instances where that happened. But you're attaching that to this idea of the daemon, aren't you? Mm, I am. And of course, you know, when we talk about Jung, Jung had his own daemon. He called it Philemon. And Philemon was an entity that, that, that was with Jung for most of his life. And I would argue that the daemon is our own higher self and that we all have a daemon, all of us. And it depends upon whether the doors of perception, as all the Suxley called them, are open. And to the extent they are open is the extent in which the daemon can communicate. Because the daemon is the part of you that's lived your life before. And this is profoundly important. The daemon knows how to guide you because it's already done it. So when people turn around and say, I had a precognitive dream, or I had a precognitive deja vu. That's not you remembering that. It's the daemon facilitating that because the daemon remembers it. It's as I, in my book uh, on Philip K. Dick, I use the term the, with Philip K. Dick, the man who remembered the future. Because I argue that we live this life more than once and it's a simulation or an instantation, which I think is a more, far more accurate term because simulation gives the impression that it's a simulation of something else, whereas it's not, it's, a, it's an instantation of itself. And I'm quoting here a guy called Dr. Andrew Gallimore, who is an associate of mine who lives in Okinawa in Japan, who is uh, an Oxford educated cybernetic engineer, very interesting guy. You must get him on your show. His book on DMT and altered states of consciousness is to die for. It's brilliant. But going back to it, so the idea is that I use the, the analogy and it's much easier as an analogy these days because people know it. Can you imagine that you were existing in a virtual reality, three dimensional first per third, first person viewpoint computer game of your life. And in that game, 
it is pro the program contains the outcome of every decision that you can possibly make. Okay. What you do is you switch on the game and literally I, I use the analogy in one of my books and say, it's as if you've put on a, a super duper feedback suit that tactilely feeds back your movements in the game. So, you know, rather like with, with the new Oculus. You actually see a pair of hands on the screen when you're in virtual reality, which are mimicking the movements of your own hands. It's quite uncanny when you do this, but the idea is that you are placed in this game and the first life you live, you don't have a daemon. You're a singular consciousness because your daemon hasn't split off from you because you are the same as your daemon. And at the end of that first life, a bifurcation takes place at the point of death, the daemon and the Adelon split off. The Adelon dies. But the daemon continues and finds itself being the game player of another, a, a reboot of the game from the moment of birth. And it, it literally is in a position where it sees or perceives the life of its Edelon on screen. Now, you can imagine a scenario here that initially the daemon can't really influence the on-screen sprite because it's independence, because it's to do with the way the brain structures, it's to do with the non-dominant and dom -dom non-dominant hemisphere is the brain. But the idea is that the, the, the on-screen sprite, say we'll use Lara Croft, which is a good example of this. So you switch on the second game, you've played the game once before, so you know the layout of the, the tomb that she's supposed to be wandering around. She starts running off and she goes into a room and she gets eaten by a monster. She gets killed, she's died. So she comes back, new game, the daemon, it's now the third game, but this time the daemon knows to not go in that room because there's a monster in there. The skill the daemon has is how it communicates with its Edelon to not have the Edelon go into that room. And this is when in life we have hunches, when we have feelings, when you meet somebody and you think, Ooh, not too sure about this person. I believe this is what really is happening is that there's part of you that's recognizing the situation and is trying to warn you. Now, if your doors of perception are vaguely open, you'll have precognitive dreams or you'll have inklings or feelings. But if your doors of perception are wider open, and I argue, for instance, people who experience temporal lobe epilepsy, the daemon can communicate much more effectively. It can speak to them sometimes. And indeed, there is a friend of mine, Myron Dial, whose daemon manifested when he was four years old, and they've been together for the whole of his life. He's now in his late seventies and his daemon is called Caron which is interesting because it's the ferryman, which again is fascinating. And, 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 and he tells me all the time about how Karen guides him, how Karen gives him visions. And there was one example he gave me where Karen gave him a vision when he was about 25 years old. And he saw in this vision, an elderly man sitting in a studio with a, a pile of books, notebooks, red notebooks. And he was surrounded by these incredible paintings and sculptures. It was only when he was in his 60s, he's sitting there in his room and he senses a presence behind him and he thinks, oh my God, looked and there were the red books in front of him and all his art was all around him. And he realized that he'd been seeing his own future. His daemon had given a glimpse of his own future. Philip K. Dick had the same things happen to him. So the idea is that the daemon guides you through multiple lives and he, it, it changes these, these, what I call, I suppose it's like an evolutionary thing that you play the game over and over again, and you follow different routes. And I argue that all of this information is digitally encoded within the universe itself, within the zero point field, within qu the quantum vacuum, it's an information field and all this information is held and it's all to do with black holes, believe it or not. And it's all to do with the way in which information is processed within black holes. And this is why in the work, in my book, I cite the work of people like Stephen Hawking, because Hawking's point of, uh, of, of Hawking radiation coming out of a black hole. And the idea is that this is a huge hologram. We are existing within a huge hologram. Reality is not what it seems at its basis. Everything is information and information that is processed by a consciousness. Because we know in quantum mechanics and quantum physics from the twin slit, twin slit experiment, there's a direct relationship between the act of observation and whether a subatomic particle is a point particle or a wave. And the act of observation 
or the act of measurement, which is the same thing, creates from a wave, which of course is something that is smeared out and has no physical presence, to a point particle, which is a point particle in three-dimensional space. Right, but hold on, hold on, hold oh, on. <laughs> right. <laughs> because, again, I'm going to circle back and say the same thing over and over again. I, 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 I love where you're going, and I love the launching off point, which is hard science, kind of irrefutable scientific truths that we found, like what you're talking about, the double slit experiment, which I always say is misnamed. It's the consciousness experiment. That's what it is. It's like, does consciousness exist? Answer over and over and over again is yes, but we don't want to talk about consciousness. So let's talk about slits and photons and the rest of that. And that's a good way to kind of change the dialogue, which is part of the social engineering project. You know, I, I won't go off on that rant that I do a million times, but what I do want to do in the process of doing that, you've really done a great job of summing up the, the ferryman theory, if you will. And you're hanging a bunch of things off it, which are tremendous. And that's why we want people to go check out the book, Cheating the Ferryman, get it, read it. It'll kind of put you right into the middle of this conversation. What, what, what I want to launch into, and it goes hand in hand. We've already been doing this. It's kind of like I said, the, the ghost skeptico, but you're a, a, a Greek file, so you get the full Socratic. You know, Socrates was all about getting people together and kind of hashing stuff out and letting the best ideas kind of rise to the top, follow the data kind of thing. And it's such a beautiful thing. And I, I, I just can't believe how it's so lost in, a, in our culture. And I get it all the time because people are offended when you go, you know, you want to say, oh, well, what about this? What about that? It's like, oh, you're challenging my beliefs. Everyone's opinion about a flat earth matters. You know, it's like, well, no, we don't really think that everyone's opinion matters. Why do we even want to play that game? So we're not going to play that game here. <laughs> and what, what I want to do is kind of pose a couple of questions to you. And a lot of them uh, kind of came up last time, but because there's so much to what you're doing and you're exploring so many areas that we can't always nail these things to the ground. So let me pick out a couple of them and then we'll see how far they go and we'll see where that takes us. So right off the bat, one of the things that seems to me maybe a bridge too far is the literal idea that you had an original life in a real universe in, in a real body, whatever that means. I think the rest of what you're saying stretches the definition of that original, what that original physical reality would be. But then the second thing I'd point you to is the reincarnation science, you know, Jim Tucker, Ian Stevenson before that. And in particular, you know, the research they did with the birthmarks that correlate to violent deaths that people had in a previous life. Because again, let me, in case people didn't pick up on this, in cheating the ferryman, you wouldn't have, it'd be a Groundhog Day situation. You're coming back in the same, you know, you're playing the same game over and over again. You're not switching to a different body. So, Jim Tucker Ian Stevenson go out and they go, oh no, th this is how it looks. And you are switching to a different body. And by the way, if you vi die a violent death, then statistically you're more likely to bring along these birth birthmarks as a physical manifestation of what you need to resolve this time around. How do you process that science? Well, I suppose I don't need to because there's no science. There is no science that supports the idea of the transmigration of souls. There is no science on that. There's no science I know. There are, there are, there are stories and there are anecdotes and there are people turning around and saying, well, you know, we've got the evidence for this, but I know no science that can explain well, how a consciousness can leave the body. Okay. Let me finish here. It's yeah. quite important. Okay. If you look at reincarnation and you look in reincarnation as it's, it's described by the various religions around the world, you start to have problems, okay? The first one is, do you reincarnate in your own social group? Some believe that you do, some religious groups do. Do you reincarnate in different parts of the world? Do you reincarnate straight away? Do you reincarnate after five years, after 10 years? They're all different. Every one of them is different from the Tlingit Indians 
in, in, in Seattle and, and in, in the, the northwestern states of the United States have a completely different model of what reincarnation is from the Hindus. Okay, so there is no standardization here of, of reincarnation because there isn't. So we can't pretend that there is. That's the first point. The second point is more important, is how does a physical body, a, a consciousness, leave one body and then come into another? Does it come in randomly? Is it chosen? Who's doing the choosing? Who decides which body that person's going to, going to come into? Now, I've read extensively the Ian Stevenson uh, work. It's very, very good. He's very, very good. But the things that he doesn't point out is pecuniary advantage in India. The vast majority of cases of reincarnation are normally individuals from a lower caste who are claiming that a previous life was a higher caste. You very rarely, if ever, get somebody from an upper caste claiming to be from a lower caste. And I find that significant. So that's that point. Let's go back then to the argument of scars. Well, A, I don't understand the process of why, because you get scarred in one life and you leave one physical body behind and another body is recreated randomly from the DNA of somebody else, how that scar transfers from one to the other. That makes no sense to me. I don't know what the process is there. But more importantly, if we have had multiple, multiple, multiple lives over thousands of years, we'll be covered in scars. All of us would be covered in scars. Why aren't we? Why is there only certain individuals have scars? And I'd say that's because it's coincidence. Or the scar has been noticed by somebody and they know that down the road, uh, somebody was killed. And what there's a, sim there's a similarity between it. But the scars aren't the same scars. The scars in the same part of the body. But statistically, that's going to happen anyway. We have moles on our bodies. You know, presumably in my myriad of previous lives that I'd have had, I'd have been killed a million, t dozens of times in different ways. Where are my scars? Why do some people have scars and not others? Why, more importantly, why do some people remember past lives and others don't? What is the process? Why is it some people do and some people don't? And indeed, why is it even more important that when you do hypnotic regression to people, the vast majority of people are regressed to being or believe themselves to be Egyptian princes or, or you know, Egypt. They love being Egypt. It's, Egypt's the big thing, isn't it? So we've got to look at this really more carefully. I work with recession, re regression hypnotists. I work with two or three of them. All of them, without exception, when we've had discussions, agree with me. What is taking place here? is there's the Jungian collective unconscious, which I call the, the uber daemon, which is the collective unconscious of all humanity, all humanity's experiences. And under certain circumstances, and every Edelonic consciousness can access that broader consciousness. Now we know from hypnotism that the kind of people that are hypnotized are the kind of people who want to come across well. We know this, there's a hypn hypnotic type so that person is going to try and draw up memories to keep the hypnotist happy. So in which case they're going to draw up memories that may either be nonsense, and a lot of them are nonsense. You know, even my friends who do this, they, that the vast majority is complete drivel. You only ever hear of the cases when they can prove them. You never hear the thousands of cases that are, are nonsense. And cannot okay, be okay, but hold on, hold on. Let me get a chance in here, okay? Because you, you're kind of laying a lot on the table, and then I'm going to try and respond, and it's going to be hard for people to go back and hear the whole thing. So a couple of things. I mean, the, the first point that I'd make is that I think you're being a little bit unfair to the various ways that we do science. Science is about observation. And it is about collecting human accounts. We accept that people experience depression. We accept that people experience grief. Our reporting on that is almost exclusively anecdotal, right? Are you grieving? Okay, let's do this. Do you feel better? Are you depressed? Do you feel better? And we have some neurological means of doing that. But for the most part, it is what we would call anecdotal until we start applying the metrics that we have in the social sciences, which at this point 
are pretty well established. I mean, people can go in and do good science about how mm. people are self-reporting about how they feel. So that, I guess, is is point one. I, I'm with you on some of what you're saying. You know, I just did an interview with uh, another guy you wouldn't like, but he's in. Uh, I like everybody. I have no problem. <laughs> I like debating. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm being facetious because I think you are incredibly, incredibly open. You know, we're having this conversation and I knew it would not be, you know, any issue to just dive into this. This is what it's all about. I, I got a feeling, I got a feeling that you do this in your head like 24 seven. So I don't, I don't worry about it, but like, I just interviewed uh, again, Dr. Gregory Shushan, I think is phenomenal. Oh, Greg's a great friend of mine. Greg, I, I adore Greg. He's been on my show a couple of times. He's a great guy. Great so guy. shared, shared near death experiences across culture, across time. And the reason I bring him up in context of this is he's with you on the fact that these things are not going to align up perfectly the way that some people would like them to do. Uh, light and love, it's always Jesus, it's always this. But in some other important ways that are the most important, that to contradict the kind of mainstream materialist paradigm, yes, we can make some conclusions about what they are experiencing in the afterlife and that there is an afterlife. So the first thing that I point out is once we once we cross that bridge and say, okay, there is some data there, then we have to recognize the fact that the data doesn't exactly align with what you're saying. And as a matter of fact, we do not have any accounts that directly report what you're saying. Because I think the other thing that what Shushan's work does is it connects us to contemporary near-death experience science done in hospital. And there we have a lot more accounts. And the accounts we could maybe in some cases fit them back into, you know, retrofit them back into the ferryman. But I don't think they come that, I don't think they come that way nat naturally. That would mm -hmm. be my take on it. We can explore that further, but yeah, let me, cause, it. cause I, I, I kind of cut you off, but I, I don't want you to cut me off until I get to this main point that I was going to make about Jim Tucker and the reincarnation science. To me, that's was, I guess, my main pushback on what you're saying. Hell yes, it's science. It is one hundred percent science. You, as that guy who read sociology, understand that the tech, that the the means that they're going about to collect and or and organize uh, this from an anthropological. Uh, sociological standpoint is a well-worn path. Here's how you interview people. Here's how you control for this. Here's how you control for that. And as you mentioned, you read that research, it is rock solid in terms of them following that protocol. Then in terms of the, 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 the scars and stuff like that, I mean, that really is pretty, pretty easy in a lot of respects to say, you know, that it it be, that becomes more of a straight statistics kind of thing. You know, what are the what number of people have this kind of birthmark at this kind of age in this kind of group, and then what are the chances that someone would experience all these other memories and would be what what number of people are killed by a gunshot wound and you know this and that. You can run some stats, and they're not going to be like. 100% accurate, but you can get pretty damn close. And they have, I think, in terms of saying, these show some meaningful patterns. And then the final point, and then I'll shut up. But I think, again, this is kind of, you're making a criticism that I think anyone would turn around and make on the ferryman. And, 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 and I don't think it's fair in either case. And that's to say that observation isn't science only putting forth a concrete causal effect for it is the only way is the only data that matters you know what i mean unless you can tell me how reincarnation works and the mechanics of it and how the soul transfers and this and that then i'm not open to listen to it and what i'd say is everything that you've built on in terms of consciousness would put us outside of that to begin with everything in science has been falsified with max planck consciousness is fundamental there is no there is no real reality here like we talked about in the last interview and like you just talked about in a minute ago so i think we have to be really careful in saying well this is real and this isn't real and realize we're kind of 
always going to be in this kind of liminal kind of in between kind of thing. Okay. So you were good enough to let me a lot on the table. I think the reason I take the approach I do is because I want to engage with the skeptics. I want to be in a position that the skeptics cannot whip my feet from under me because skeptics very rarely engage with me. They run away. They don't engage with me because I'm not an easy person to, to, to diss and to, uh, make look stupid and idiotic because the science I deal with is based upon absolute, as you say, it's research and it's science. Now, if I start making statements that, you know, there's that famous cartoon that really affected me many, many years ago, you know, there's a chalkboard and the scientists and they've got something here and then they've got something there. And in the middle, they've got a miracle happens to get round some of the issues in science. I don't do the God of the gaps. I don't do that. I try to make sure that if I present something and I, I present a hypothesis, I don't call it a theory. It's not a theory. It's a hypothesis. It may not even be a hypothesis. It's possibly speculation. But what I do is I say, well, look, this is this bit of information. This is this bit of information from this research field in quantum mechanics, from this research field in neurology, from this research field in cosmology. If you take the facts as they stand from the research, what conclusions can you come to? And that's what I try to do. I come from the science and I say, well, what conclusions can you draw from the fact that people, when the brain is stimulated in certain ways by people, by external forces, when like, for instance, Wilder Penfield in the 1930s, the 1970s exposed the human brain uh, of, of, uh, of epileptics and put an electrode onto particular points of the temporal lobes. And when he did that, he was able to evoke past life memories. These past life memories were three-dimensional and vivid. He concluded towards the end of his life that the human brain records every single experience and event from the moment of the birth to the moment of death. The question has to be why. Now, on my own podcast, I interviewed a few months ago a young lady by the name of Rebecca Sharrock. Rebecca Sharrock has superior autobiographical memory. She remembers every single thing in her life. She also remembers her dreams. She remembers being in the womb, but I don't accept these things at face value. So what we did was during the interview, we, I didn't tell her I was going to do it. And I didn't tell my assistant I was going to do this, but I know that Rebecca really likes the Harry Potter books. Now, you know, there's a number of Harry Potter volumes. Now, Sarah, my assistant, her daughter reads Harry Potter. So Sarah has all the volumes of Harry Potter. And I said to Sarah, can you pick up at random one of the volumes of Harry Potter's books? Can you open a page at random and can you pick a paragraph at random and start reading it? She started doing this. Believe it or not, Sarah read three words and Rebecca repeated the whole paragraph word by word, absolutely word perfect. Now the question here has to be, what is the function of this? If the brain is working along certain routes, why, what's the point of remembering everything in our lives if we can't recall it? It's like you've got the mystery, you've got a million dollars locked inside a, it's locked inside a, a safe with the key inside. It makes no sense unless it fulfills a purpose. I have evidence in my books of people who have, towards the end of their life, they, when they're coming down with Alzheimer's, they start to recall their past life in detail. They start to go back in time. They start to relive earlier parts of their lives as if their brain is functioning them to get back to reliving their life again. Now that's tangible proof. That's not, so in other words, I'm not turning around saying, I believe, or I'd like to believe that we live our lives again through, through memories. I have the evidence for it. Now there's, a, can I just finish? Can I just finish here on your final point about the def definition of science? There's a science of social sciences and a social scientist, I can say this, the social science, we deal with statistics. We deal with norms. We deal with means. We deal with 
you know, what is the statistical chance of this happening in a particular way? That's, that's scientific to an extent. But if you're going to convince a physicist or you're going to convince a biologist of your point of view, there's no point in turning around and saying that 90% of the population claim they've had past lives. That's anecdote. And they will just throw back at you. The plural of anecdote is not proof. And that's what I don't do. What I do is I try to say, well, let's fight them at their own battle. Let's take their science and use their science and put it back at them with a model that they, they, ca they cannot dispute. Do I deny out of the body experiences? No, I don't. Do I deny past lives? No, I don't. Do I, d do I deny, you know, the near death experience and the, the typologies of the near death experience? No, I don't. None of these things I deny because there's too many reports of them clearly and self-evidently. Right. Well, I didn't hold on. I didn't say that you denied any of it. I said, and, and this is the part where I, I kind of think I do have to kind of hone in on this. I mean, don't you think just in the story that you just told, you, you get to a point where you're making that same leap that everyone else is making in terms of interpreting what the data that you have in a particular way, and you're finding it compatible with your theory. And I'm saying, you know, I, I don't, but it's not like you're not doing the same thing that everyone else is doing. And I think it's valid no, no, to no, do I, that. I disagree. I disagree. If somebody is saying reincarnation, they're not using any science. They're not using. But see, to Tony, Tony, that's not. Uh, I, I just don't think. Let's let's put it in this way: in the court of public opinion, I don't think most people would agree with you. If you look at Jim Tucker and you look at where's the science? Where's the science in Jim? What science is Jim Tucker applying? Well, first which, of all, which first of all, it? okay, which it? This is where you're. This is where I think you're. You're kind of uh, not being totally fair because physics wouldn't apply to your story of Rebecca and her recalling Harry yes, Potter. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Because no, it it's your, the brain, the, the no, brain, no, it, it would be your, it would be your interpretation. Well, what is of, an interp, I'm interpreting that Rebecca remembered say. everything. I'm interpreting well, that's well, an interpretation. Okay. Well, here's the point then. I, again, I think we're, I don't want to get into a semantic battle. But I, I, I want to kind of interpretation you're suggesting that I'll I show you by, I will show you by example. Bring so, something. so you take Jim Tucker, Jim Tucker, University of Virginia, perceptual sciences, picks up Ian Stevenson's work. They also do a lot of re, uh, near death experience science. there. published in a lot of peer reviewed journals, highly regarded university, not a slouchy scientist. So he's. He within the academy is considered doing good science. And again, he's not a meat puppet uh, materialist. He's not a skeptic. He's not any of that. If you look at the cases that he brings forward that, that gain a lot of traction with people like me, again, because he's a careful scientist. And he does one of his cases, is one of his cases, the Leninger case. Is that Jim Tucker? Yes. Yeah. Do you Jenna, know the Leninger case? Do you know the work that Michael Lee Sudduth has written on that? Well, I, I don't. Uh, well, you should. Well, you should. Because he destroys it. <laughs> I, I, I don't think. He utterly I, destroys it. I don't, I don't think he does. Because the case. You that, don't. <laughs> okay. Why? How, doesn't, how, does, how does Lee Sudduth not destroy the Lenin well, case? Well, first of all, so here, I, I am speaking when I say, like I just told you, I don't know his work, but I know a lot of cranky people that try and trash people like Jim Tucker, who seem from my experience to be carefully doing work and following their critics to the full extent that if I had to place my bet here without knowing the, the cranky guy who kind of pushed against it, I would bet. Why is he on cranky? Jim. Why? why Let why me is, finish. Why, hold, why on, is, hold on. Why, Tony, why is he Tony. Cranky? Why is he Tony, I am happy to. I'm happy to to follow up once I know the guys. Once I go know the guys' work. Well, well you use the term cranky. You said he was cranky. In my experience, you cranky, yeah, you can put him in cranky. Yeah, well, probably, I'd say high probability of cranky. Really, well, you need to read it, and you need to. I, I do, I do, okay. I do, I do need well, to I read it. Call, I wouldn't call somebody cranky if I'd not read their work. You're you're kind of trying to make like points of like argumentative points rather than let no, me I'm get not. to no i'm not let you me use the term cranky over somebody who is a professor of philosophy 
at another university. Philosophy, looked that's at the good. the Leninger case, and it is full of holes. Well, I, I will. I, I should will, have looked up this. I, I know tell you that, what. You know, and he hasn't. He's so, really so look, look why don't, said. why don't you, why don't you, what's his name again? Uh, Lee Suddeth, Michael Lee Suddeth. How do you spell that? S-U-D-D-I-T-H. Okay. Let's get him on. Oh, let's get him on Skeptico, right? Will you help yeah, me? Yeah, you need to. Get, get, well, <laughs> I think I just suggested that, so. I don't know. Good. I need to is an appropriate response to that. And we can do, uh, we can do a full blown kind of thing. Cause, and if need be, I can talk to, uh, Jim Tucker either. That before. would be really interesting. If you got Jim Tucker and Mike on together, because well, they talk maybe... to each other regularly, they know each other very, very well. Oh, so, so Jim way. Tucker has rave, has raved, waved the white flag and said, uh, I, I'm sorry the that my case is wrong. Siddhartha is right. Uh, from my readings of it, he's not actually run away, but he's not actually contested it. I need to check with Mike about that. Mike, had, Mike has written check a, on that. an academic paper on it. Check uh, on that. I don't think okay. Jim Tucker has backed off of that. Would that make any difference since you seem to have some respect for Tucker? Would it make any difference? If I have he... respect for both of them. I have respect for both of them. I think both of them. My concern is that. When? You never did. You never did let me finish because oh, here's sorry, the point I want sorry, to make. My apology. Sorry. Here's the point I, I want to make is that, and I don't think you're you're being fair in this regard. Is that you're countering that this isn't evidence, right? And whether you, you know your guy Suddeth has kind of shattered the evidence or not, we're now in the same. We're talking about the same thing now. We're talking about specific instances that happened in some physical reality like the case that i was going to talk about is ryan in the hollywood case you know where he was a former film star in hollywood in a previous life and they go back and they trace this and jim tucker says hey there's 52 points of congruence that i found it's like whether you agree with his conclusions or whether you agree point by point with what he's saying matches up we now have a science if you will that people acknowledge is a valid way to look at the statistical probability that this kid would have knowledge of these uh, past events so mm -hmm. it, in that way I, I i think that there is a direct parallel to what you're doing both are have have scientific merit to some degree and then it's just a matter of hammering out you know which one's better whether all the facts line up whether you know this guy or that guy has has crushed this or that but i i, I it seems to me like you kind of dismiss this out of hand when no, i don't it's I really don't. the same it's really the same thing just said a different way I, in terms I, of how you would go about how you would go about quote unquote proving it and it's not about this isn't about physics and your thing isn't about physics jim tucker's uh, belief that Ryan is uh, has this ability to recall things from the past isn't he doesn't need to apply an explanation regarding the mechanics of how he does it in order to offer us a good observation about uh, mm. something that's happening. Yeah, observation is is profoundly important in the social sciences. It's it's extremely important, but you then have to go back to say, well, what is then the mechanism that's at work? And again, I would, I would suggest that the mechanism at work here could just as easily be collective unconscious memory. You know, as I said earlier on, this young lad could be focusing in on the information field. I know that the, the new age is called it the Akashic field. I'd call it the zero point field whereby you can pick up information from other people. Um, we don't know that. Hmm? I mean, well, I, I, I tend to agree with that but we don't know that on some kind of physics base we don't have a mechanism for a description of what it would be like to have an akashic field how information would flow from we don't have any of that so that's where i'm saying you're no we yeah. don't we you are in the same ballpark as everyone else no, in terms no, no of i'm not i'm not that's the difference there's been recent research shown to prove that for instance information has mass okay it's also been there's also the latest research in terms of cosmology and the relationship of the holographic universe is incredibly well researched science using known science 
to explain how the holographic principle could work. There's a guy called Lee Horgan at the Perimeter Institute in Canada who's doing work on trying to work out the pixelation of the program. You know, this is science. You know, there, there was a, a front page of Scientific American a few years ago. Is reality a hologram? There's actually a science called the holographic principle. About yeah, but they haven't. I'll give you an example of science. When we talk about science, what we're really talking about, I think, in the way that most people think about it, is not scientific theory, but they're really talking about engineering. So that's when we talk about entanglement. Okay, show me the quantum modem, and now you got my attention. I'm not a big fan of uh, Dr. Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona, and I shouldn't say that. I'm a huge fan of Dr. Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona. I think his project with the soul phone i wish him the best of luck and i certainly hope it works out but i i, I don't really to me it seems a little bit flawed in the way that they're going about that but 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 it's I'm, interesting i don't want to bury i don't want to bury the lead the point is they are trying to engineer this in a way that would answer these questions and if you will that to me would offer some kind of proof of what they're talking about in terms of after death communication it would be you you would but you would still be in the same boat tony i don't know you, you could then you could then take their data and interpret it as damon ferryman higher self whatever and another guy could interpret it as demonic uh, akashic record with a spirit in between and no one would have a, a better standing in on that than the other one it all becomes speculative at a point so we're, we're trying to merge it but i mean there's always going to be these huge gaps where we need uh constructive theories uh, that, that don't necessarily line up with each other i mean take julie I'll, I'll, and then i'll shut up but take julie beichel who i've always been a big fan of and been on this show in after death communication shit she's got a phd in pharmacology she knows how to do that shit she's not she's not making mistakes in her research and she's validating after death communication and that after death communication does not conform with the ferryman theory so what do you do with that you just step over it and say that isn't science i don't know it's the same way we figure out uh, you know whether a drug is good to use I think, I, I, I think one of the things you're missing here and it's a very important point cheating the ferryman works in a brain that hasn't died. There might be after death. There could be after death. Within, you know, the idea is, and this people misunderstand this. They think that, and it's because my publishers use the term life after death and everything, and it's always quite irritated me over this. It takes place in the final seconds of your life and then in microseconds of your life. Okay. So at the end of all of that, just like Connors in Groundhog Day moves on to the next day, I'd argue that within cheating the ferryman, you eventually move on and you move on to whatever you move on to. Because in terms of time, it's all happened in, in a constricted part of time at the end of life. Now, again, using parallels, and I know that it's, it's not fair of me to use the parallel here, but because it's a religious parallel, but you read up the Bardo state, in, in, in Tibetan Buddhas, what takes place there is that it's the kind of transitory point between moving on to your next incarnation, as it were, because for instance, I don't understand if there's afterlife communication with dead people, how does that square with reincarnation? If everybody's reincarnated, they're reincarnated as different people. So but it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to square, right? It, that's what well, we're saying. It it? Doesn't... Well, they're both the same. So both happen reincarnation but, and people going to heaven and communicating through mediums happens. Does so look, happen so look a, a, as we, as we head around the curve and head towards, uh, towards home here, I, I want to say, like, I want to point out one thing that you just mentioned that is like back to the beginning of back. What I love about your work, I was like the point you just made is something that really sent me in a whole different direction. Paradigm change. I was like, drop the mic. This guy is really, it, 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 it's, it's great. Here's the point that you just made is that if you accept there is a non-space, non-time, non-locality outside of space, outside of time, then you have to be open to the possibility that everything can happen in a nanosecond. 
everything that that you're talking about and and this is you this is tony peak talking about uh, an explanation for near-death experience an explanation i don't quite agree with him 100 but i think it's undeniable where you've taken us there and where you've kind of uh propelled us into just like your work in understanding extended consciousness realms so I just want to bring it back because I want to know where else you're going and what else you're doing. And I want to wrap this dialogue up and we'll have to have another one, but I want people to know how I balance these two things in saying, Hey, I don't agree with this guy on everything, but this guy is so cutting edge. He's got so many great ideas and is synthesizing so much great research that we really, really have to listen to him and pay attention. Do you know what, do you know what I like about you? You're the only person that interviews me, that challenges me properly, that really makes me think, puts me on the spot. And this is what I do with my friends. And this is what you normally do when you're down the pub arguing ideas. And this is what I love about your work. And this is what I love about what you do. You really know your stuff. And it's great because great things happen when minds like you and I and various other people, we sit around and we debate round the subject. We come round and we appreciate each other's position and we discuss each other's position. It's profoundly important. And indeed, that's the route where I'm going to be going with my work now. I, I feel that I've probably completed my book cycle. I, I don't think I've got anything really more to say. I'm thinking um, probably writing maybe some more biographies, uh, possibly. I'm also debating with a, a, a friend of mine uh, who's got a PhD in, in William Shakespeare of doing a book on Shakespeare and the occult. Maybe. And also I'm working with a couple of associates where we're working on maybe a recreation of the Philip experiment that took place in Toronto in, uh, in 1970. With- wow. That would be, that's scary, isn't it? Does that, it is does that pushing with the egregorials again. And also I'm working very closely with an associate of mine. Again, somebody you need to get on your show and Samantha Lee Treasure, who's doing some fascinating work with her new book, which will be out next year on non-standard ghosts. And I'm really interested in this idea of, of ghosts that are like cartoon ghosts or physical objects that you see as ghosts. And also, I'm also keen on actually taking the idea of the daemon further and trying to do some experiments really to, to, to really get into the idea of how we can develop it as well. So a lot of exciting things going on. We, we ought to do some of the, we ought to do some of these shows together. With, we do. So, what a great idea. Fun. Alex, that would be brilliant because. It's kind of point to counterpoint and it, it, it works. You know, the way the, the old Socratic dialogues, you know, it's thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Exactly. That's what we're doing. That's what we were just doing there. You know, and, it's and I think, Bohmian I, dialogue. Exactly. And I, do, I think I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, if we hash it out, we can kind of model for people that it isn't the debate as much as it is, uh, you know, sharing of information that pulls something down so that it can be replaced by something else not to just you know do that so yeah we should see we could even we'll, we could even think of some ways to uh to reinforce that that is the principle of it so we should do that i'd love, love to do that. it I on skeptico i absolutely love that idea we, we, we should absolutely do it on skeptico and you know what it makes me think of and i wanted to touch on this before we before i let you go the last time we talked this is such a cool thing. I don't know if you're able to do it because the whole pandemic thing happened, but you were going to do the Plato's cave thing in Greece. Did that mm. ever, did that ever come about? Still working on it. We're still planning it. I've, I've just come back from Athens. I was in Athens a few weeks ago and we're still very keen to do it. Yeah. We, we feel we could do something extraordinary there and maybe do it as a, a, a film as well, you know, cause we're thinking of using drones and everything else as well. So yeah, we really, really want to do that. And we need to, to convince the Greek government that it's something we want to do. But my Greek publisher, and there's now, I've now got two books out in Greek. He's very keen on trying to help us out with this as well. So if anybody's interested or, or anything else, please let us know, because this, this is going to be really cool. Really, really cool. I'm interested. I might come over for Next week, you're with it. You're with it. To the land okay. of your fathers, you know, why not? It, why not? Why not? Absolutely. Alex, it's always wonderful to talk to you. I really, really, really buzz. When we finish chewing our chats, I just really buzz and I go, oh, I should have said that, or I should have said that. And that's the mark of a good dynamic. Absolutely, Tony. You're fantastic. We will do it again. We will, we will create the, 
the new egregores. We'll create. <laughs> okay, my friend. You take okay. care. Okay, Alex. Take care. Okay, bye. Thanks again to Anthony Peak for joining me today on Skeptico. By the way, if you're wondering, and I hope you are wondering, what's the point if you're not wondering? Yeah, Suddeth is just the cranky skeptic. And Jim Tucker destroys him in his response. Anyways, that'll be something we can, if you like, hash out in the forum. That'll be the question. Who do you think is right? Tucker versus Suddeth. And then why is Anthony, Tony Peake, taking sides with Suddeth? There's no way that Suddeth would ever support his ferryman theory. There's just no way because he's a cranky skeptic. So why is he championing the guy? It's, it's the, pro I was going to answer my own question, but I won't come to the forum, answer it for me. Till next time, take care. Bye for now.